Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to our online lecture. The course title remains History of the Commonwealth of Nations. The course code is HIS302. And I'm still your instructor, Dr. Chineye Chibwezi. So these five topics are our focus topics for these exams. They will also serve as your areas of areas of concentration. But you are supposed to study this, you are supposed to listen to this video in conjunction with your materials I earlier gave you. So please, while you listen to this video, make sure you also study your materials afterwards, you know, connect both of them and to really help you to, you know, um, understand the course and answer your questions very well. Okay. Ready? Okay, let's go. Topic number one. Our first topic is on concept and history of the Commonwealth of Nations. And this is only going to be a revision because we've done it earlier, right? So the first thing in this topic is understanding what the Commonwealth is. And we already know that the Commonwealth is a unique international organization with member states from 54 countries of the world as at now. And they will recognize the Queen of England as the head of the organization. Why? Because many of the countries who are now today member countries, who are now member countries of the Commonwealth of Nations, were once colonized by the British government. But today, wherein all the countries have gotten their political independence from British, they all still choose to remain in this um, organization for one reason or the other to benefit themselves. The best definition for understanding or how or what the Commonwealth of Nations is as, as an organization is drawn from the Commonwealth Charter, right? And it's described as a voluntary organization or a voluntary association of independent and equal sovereign states, each responsible for its own policy, consulting and cooperating in the common interests of their peoples and in the promotion of international understanding and world peace and also influencing international society to the benefit of all through the pursuit of common principles and values. Okay, so that is what the Commonwealth is. In a nutshell, it's an inter international organization. Okay, so moving on to number two, history. Look at the history, how did the Commonwealth become the organization it is today? The first thing I'd like to reiterate is that the Commonwealth of Nations it's, um, it's not the usual organizations such as the United Nations and all that. The unique thing, that, the unique thing about this organization is that many of them, you know, they, they were once colonized by the British, who is still, whose queen is still recognized as their head, you know, but they all chose voluntarily to be in this organization for one reason or the other. Now, the evolution of this um of this commonwealth of nations cannot be discussed without talking about how it began and it evolved from a, an, an empire you know once upon a time there was a british empire a great empire the greatest and the wildest empire in the world an empire which the sun never set on it had almost a quarter of the world population in fact 23 percent so about 23 percent of the world's population and you know so many member nations in all seven continents of nations, they were all colonized by the British and they were all nations who were under the influence of the British Empire. And you would find countries in Africa, Antarctica, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America and South America all colonized. They were all under this majestic British Empire. But with history and as you know, everything is bound to change. Certain circumstances eventually made this British Empire began to decline and eventually became a commonwealth. You know, a commonwealth. And anyway, a commonwealth is you know, a British Empire. Um, a British Empire is an extensive group of states or countries ruled over by a single monarch, whereas a commonwealth is an independent country or a self-governing unit. Now, how did this British Empire? managed to give up its, its, its claim, its powers, and, you know, now become a commonwealth. So we'll see. To understand the history of the commonwealth, we'll break them into three main periods. One, the colonial period. Two, the decolonization period. And three, 
the globalization of the globalized period of the commonwealth of nations okay the colonial period so we like to look at this beginning from um the year 1169 as far as that time so about 1949 okay and the most unique thing about this colonial period was at this period you know um at this period was when all the nations in there were part they were under this commonwealth or they were under the british empire were still colonized they were still colonized they didn't have political independence economic independence you know full or, or rather they didn't have full political or economic um, independence they were all under the british empire at the time 69 as i said and one of the first countries which they had um which they colonized was the dublin you know the irish bill in dublin okay 13 american colonies were all under this period or this time they were all colonized including you know uh, colonies such as Co connecticut uh delaware virginia rhode island new hampshire massachusetts and pennsylvania also other countries were colonized at this time included bermuda bahamas india singapore and even lagos our own lagos nigeria was eventually colonized in 1861 and were all under the british empire so this great British Empire also had a way of classifying their various, the various countries that were under them at the time. And they would call them names ranging from dominions to colonies to protectorates, mandates, and other territories. This, empire, this, this conference in 1926 that the British Empire became a commonwealth because it became a commonwealth by agreeing with dominions, you know, and I thought there were different classifications, by agreeing with dominions that they were all equal members of a community within the British Empire and owed, but, but, but they owed allegiance to the British Queen. Now, looking at the decolonization period, we we'll look at this decolonization period again from 1949 to 1965. And the punchiest thing that happened during this decolonization period in this history of the Commonwealth was that the Commonwealth moved from being an, a white man club or all an all white men club at the time to multiracial club. So you would now find people of um, nations, who were, uh, black man nation, the red skin, and all that. How did that happen? One of the things that contributed this to these things was the effect of the world wars, World War One, and World War Two. So by the, by the time the war ended, many of these countries now started to ask between, yeah, give us our independence, win their independence, you know. And then one after the other, they started to gain their political independence. And somehow again, they all voluntarily joined to, in this Commonwealth of Nations Assembly and remained as, mem as members. Also, another thing that happened with this period was that the name changed from British Commonwealth to the Commonwealth of Nations. The period here we look at is the globalization period of the Commonwealth of England. However, what makes it a globalized Commonwealth today is that countries that were not colonized by Britain have become members. For example, Mozambique was never colonized by Britain and it joined the Commonwealth in 1995. And more recently in 2008, Rwanda, who was also never colonized by Britain, joined the Commonwealth. Hi, welcome back. So, moving on to our second topic today, we'll be looking at the Commonwealth structure and aims. A picture that was taken during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in, here in Nigeria, Asurok, 2003. So, that picture had our then president, who was our president then? We had our then president sitting next to the Queen as a host of the meeting, and the Queen of England came, he graced the occasion. So, that is what um, the kind of uh, photo ops you see after the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings. Okay? okay. Now, the third picture you see with those, uh, with those guys sitting in the round table is what um, the Commonwealth Ministerial Group meetings look like. The third picture you see there is the Commonwealth, the photo of the Commonwealth Secretariat, which is the Marlborough House in London. So now let's look at them a little bit in detail. Okay. One. First of all, before we begin, remember that the Commonwealth has no formalized constitution. 
you know it is guided by a set of agreements that is called you know declarations issued by heads of governments at their various summits you know, it was not until it was not until 2012 that the commonwealth charter was signed into effect you know and it was drawn still drawn largely from two different uh, declarations you know two different agreements or talks that were held by the during the commonwealth heads of government meetings right some of the aims some of the aims which they say they will tackle include to promote democracy, good governance, respect for human rights, respect for rule of law, to focus on sustainable economic and social development. They engage in gender equality matters, international peace, security, and other issues. Now, looking at actually... Um, Actually, what is this? Now, looking at those three structures we earlier mentioned, okay? Um, the first thing we'll look at is Commonwealth Heads of Government Meetings. That is a key, key arm of the Commonwealth of Nations. And the Commonwealth Head of Government Meetings is, the first thing you should know is that, one, it is the main decision-making forum of the Commonwealth so the heads of government meets biannually that is every two to two years in any country which they agree you know and you know they have the sit down have certain discussions and from those discussions you know from those agendas some things that were discussed they are now at the end of the meeting certain certain agreements are reached and these agreements which are called declarations are, are what it's eventually implemented how they are the things that are eventually implemented by members and then by the secretariat, which is another arm of the government. This Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting is important, you know, because it is in these meetings that those it is this meeting that you know the soul of the Commonwealth, like if, if a if a country had an issue that it wanted to trash and bring to General Assembly, it is in this meeting, the meetings like this that they are trashed. It's also meetings like this that appoints the Secretary General of the organization. Because by the time meeting ends, people someone, someone or some persons have to take over, right? Yes, yeah, so it was at these meetings that the people who actually drive the Commonwealth of Nations at the end of meetings of Chogum uh, take up. So that's where they get the agenda, that's where they get their, their marching orders, so to speak. So at these meetings that such um, Secretary General are appointed, and it is also in meetings like this that the uh, Deputy Secretary Generals are appointed, and um, the annual budget is approved. Any key, any key decision that needs to be made is made during meetings like this. Okay, the second meetings, the, the, the second uh, arm we'll look at here is the ministerial group. Now, the ministerial group was set up in 1995. That's not always been there, but due to certain uh, happenings and occurrences in the world at the time, from 1999, the Commonwealth of Nations as an assembly, you know, the Chogun group decided, you know what, we have to set up this ministerial group, and the ministerial group is set up by is is managed you know by a select few a select few members so out of 54 member countries or 53 at the time only eight member countries or foreign ministers of member countries were allowed to be in a ministerial group so this was a smaller body where certain issues would be discussed in detail specifically their mandates or their terms of reference was to assess violations of principles by member countries and most importantly to recommend measures for collective actions you know such as sanctions or suspensions or whatever that was recommended by so yeah so the third uh, the third arm we'll look at is the commonwealth secretariat the commonwealth secretariat is based in london right remember remember this photo is this photo so that is the commonwealth secretariat building it's the permanent you know they are always there that is where they stay that's where they function out of in london and it is headed by a secretary general for a, renew for a renewable four-year tenure assisted by two deputy secretary generals and other staff so the commonwealth has lots and lots of campaigns he engaged in including commonwealth universities commonwealth fund commonwealth foundation and all not and it is these assets it is this secretariat that by the time the heads of government go home after their um, biannual meetings they take up the work the core work okay so it is a key instrument for conducting and coordinating the activities of the organization. It implements the decisions of the heads of government. 
it oversees the functioning of specialized bodies such as the Commonwealth Foundation and universities, like I just mentioned. They are the ones that actually sit down to, you know, through their main their, their offices, different offices they were now created to overlook certain issues like that. So they would now really oversee it. Now, this this the role or the office of this Commonwealth Secretary General. It's a, it's quite it's quite it's quite a critical one, you know. Even even before meetings are held, he's the guy. It's his office that have to come up with agendas and need to discuss. If there are certain issues happening in the world, it's his office. It's job is office to take notes, uh, as as regards the uh, member countries. It's job is office to take notes, bring these things up for discussion, if whether by reported by other nations or not. The Secretary General too has to have some unique characteristics, you know. He has people to manage the entire affair. It has to be committed to protecting the Commonwealth values and principles as is enshrined in the Commonwealth Charter. He maintains high-level contact with member nations, with heads of government, with um, foreign ministers, you know, it's his job. And most importantly, he has to exercise good office for peace roles. You know, he has to be a good, a, a do-gooder. He has to be the guy that go in between, go between, he has to work with leaders even when political tension arises, he has to be the guy that will have the calm head. He's a true diplomat. He has to be a true diplomat. You know, he has to be the one that would make sure he keeps bringing the various heads of nations to dialogue, to maintain the values, the principles of the Commonwealth. And and, and most especially, he oversees the specialized body. Can mention that. So the current Secretary General is Right Honorable Patrick Scotland, and she's from uh, Dominica Republic. She has been there since 2016 up until now. I told you it's a four-year term, but it could be renewed. So she has done her first-year term, and it was renewed. Interestingly, she's also the first woman that has ever handled such a position. And other, some other Secretary Generals has been Arnold Smith, Sherry Dats Ranfell, and our very own Emeka Anyoko from Nigeria. And he ruled from, he, he served from 1990 to the year 2000. Okay? And, you know, that is how they have run these organizations up until this moment. Okay? So um, let, me, let me also quickly tell you something. The, the, the logo you see at the top, is it top right, left? The top, I don't know how your screen would be. At the top right corner, it's in the top right corner of my screen right now. The blue logo with um, the yellow globe and the spare head is a photo, is a photo or is the flag of the Commonwealth of Nations, okay? So wherever you see this flag, please take note, it is the flag of the Commonwealth of Nations. So the blue color there, the, um, it represents royalty and the globe there, has to represent all the many nations of the world who are who are member who have you know who are member nations who are uh, members of the Commonwealth. It shows that the Commonwealth is uh, it's um, you know it's open to many nations of the world. And those line 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 they they do not represent the number of countries. However, what they represent is that those lines there. They are called spearheads, spearheads, right? So they represent the many facets, you know, the many functions of the Commonwealth, you know, the many things that they do all over, you know, all over the world, okay? That's what it represents. And you see that flag, it is always flown at Marlborough House, London, all year round. The flag never goes down. See that long pole there? It is always flying the flag of the Commonwealth all year round to show, um, to remind us of the functions of the Commonwealth. Always there, and the uh, but during during uh, Chogom Chogom meetings, during heads of government meetings, or during ministerial group meetings, you know, the flag has flown at Commonwealth flag will be flown for limited periods of time, but at the secretariat of the Commonwealth, the flag is always flown twenty four seven, all year round, the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth secretariat. Okay, so. Those are the three things we have looked at today. Hello and welcome back. This is our third topic. So we've done two topics out of five. So this is our third topic and we're going to be very quick with this one. So here we'll be looking at the declaration, declarations of the Commonwealth. 
Now, this picture you see with those gentlemen standing was is an iconic photo. It's an iconic historical photo because it was taken during the London Heads, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 1949. Remember what I said happened there? He was there. It was during these meetings that the, com that the modern Commonwealth was signed into existence. So that's an iconic meeting. That's an iconic photo, an iconic meeting. And the last photo you see there with those gentlemen sitting down was taken during the Singapore uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings in 1971. Right? So via these pictures, we're able to look in, you know, have some visual, uh, a visual image of what some of these things are to help us understand the course as we go ahead. So essentially, heads of government come, they sit together, they discuss like gentlemen, they reach agreements which would benefit their various member nations. Okay. Briefly, we'll look at the Singapore Declaration of 1971. So these were the, um, obviously the declarations that were reached during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings held in Singapore in 1971. During this meeting, during this conference, the Commonwealth, like I earlier said, you know, when, when I was, when I was, um, when I was defining the Commonwealth, the, the defining of the meaning of Commonwealth of Nations, I told you that the best definition for it was drawn from the Singapore Declaration which was eventually translated into the Commonwealth Charter, wherein I got that uh, the definition. So again, it was during this, this uh, convention, during this Jogum Head of Government meetings, that these various declarations now came out from, that eventually serves as a roadmap for the Commonwealth today. So some of the most important declarations or agreement that was reached there was that the Commonwealth, the modern Commonwealth was defined as a voluntary association of independent states, each responsible for its own policies, consulting, cooperating in common interests of their people, and in promotion of international understanding and peace. So it was this, uh, this definition that was everyone agreed, oh yes, yes. All the member nations heard it and they said, you know what, yes, that sounds like us, that sounds like what we do. Also, during in the declaration, they all agreed and stressed belief. All the member nations, you know, they stressed, they all agreed, yes, we believe in liberty, they all agreed in equal, that they believed and would fight for equal rights of all men, regardless of their race, regardless of their color, creed, political be uh, beliefs, and, you know, on, they believed that all men had the inalienable right to participate in free democratic processes. They also committed, they as a commonwealth also committed to pursuit of international peace and order, and they expressed support for the United Nations, okay? Also, it's condemned, they condemned racial prejudices. They saw it as a dangerous sickness and warned against world disparity be between nations, between humanity. And finally, another thing they did, which we look at is that they committed members to keep working for free flow of international trade on fair and equitable terms, right? So if you ask to discuss the, common, the Singapore declarations, if you wanted to say what what did they what do these people even talk about say, during their meetings, these are some of the things that they talked about during the Singapore Common Health uh, during the, the Singapore Chogom in 1971. So they so the next declaration which we'll briefly look at is the Harare declarations. The Harare declaration and the photo there in purple it captured everything that was discussed during the um, the, Ch the, the Chogom meeting here in Harare. But, you know, we're keeping it brief here. So if you wanted to see a full document, you could always go online and see it or check into your textbook to what we'll discuss. But one thing I want to say about this um, uh, Harare Declaration of 1991 was that it was a direct descendant of the Singapore Declarations, okay? So while so it was drafted, you know, that Singapore Declaration, there, certain things were happening in the international theater at the time that influenced all this talk. It's not like the, the heads of government just wanted to talk. Set, you know, in the context of the North and South conflict, you know, there was a lot of talk of the Cold War, a uh, lot of talk around Cold War, a lot of talk around colonialism, appetite, it was the days of the Soviet Union, the days of the U.S. having issues with the Soviet Union, North and South bloc and all that. So the international theater was quite tense. 
So the Singapore declarations, you know, they now started saying, you know, we believe in liberty, believe in equal rights. They had to just reassure themselves and make sure they were on the same table for whose sides they were fighting on. And, you know, based on the lessons learned from the Cold War, they had to re-emphasize uh, certain things. So while the Singapore declarations placed emphasis on democracy, human rights, rule of law in an international context, 20 years later, in 1991, when they regathered in Harare again, these same organizations still placed emphasis on democracy, human rights, and rule of law, with emphasis within nations, right? It was also around this time that um, apartheid in South Africa was really one of the hottest issues in, in international discourse, you know? So they're now there, and the Commonwealth was quite involved in helping to resolve apartheid. Most, uh, most importantly, they all renewed vigor, you know, they all, again, they swore, the heads of government pledged to work in the 10 areas, in 10 areas, all right, uh, which were pro promotion and of fundamental political values, equality for women, environmental protection, and other things which they had already been doing, but this time they re-emphasized that they will continue to work on these issues for the good of the member states and mankind. Okay. Mm. The third declaration we'll look at is the Millbrook Commonwealth Action Program on Harare Declaration in 1995. So in 1995, this group of fine gentlemen and heads of government again gathered in, in, to, in Millbrook to discuss, you know, certain so you there was actually taken during the Millbrook Commonwealth Action Pro, uh, Program. So they were trying to re-emphasize and actually trying to um, make sure that they were on course with the things they had already agreed in in 1991 at Harare. So now again in Millbrook, when they got it again, you know, they reaffirmed those things. Okay. Now among other things, they called on, secret on the Secretariat to, to enhance its capacity to provide advice, trainings, and other form of assistance on different matters to member nations. Okay. Also, they outline measures in response to the violations of the Harare Principles. The Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, short from CMAG, was now established to deal with serious or persistent uh, violations of the principles of Harare and other declarations. Okay, So that was what they achieved. That was the landmark achievement of that meeting. And finally, we'll be looking at the Commonwealth Charter. Come 2012, a landmark document called the Commonwealth Charter was finally approved. Finally, the final draft was approved by heads of government meeting, heads of government during their meeting in 2012. And in 2013, the Queen of England finally ratified the Charter of the Commonwealth of Nations. Okay? So, it set out the governance arrangements, it set out the roles of principal Commonwealth agents, it set out the rights, it set out responsibilities of members in that organization. It also outlined the core value of the organization and the aspirations of its members to include democracy, human rights, national peace, sustainable development, and uh, environmental protection, and other matters. However, this Commonwealth Charter, unlike the Charter of other organizations such as the United Nations, it did not contain or define the structure of the Commonwealth, you know, rigidly, you know. It was even silent on what constituted the organs of the Commonwealth. He also did not mention what functions, such as the branches or a or arms, you know, of the Commonwealth should function. It did not, it did not state it explicitly, you know. So it is not quite a constitution, but it's something called a charter. At least it was something that all the member nations could refer to after, uh, after many years of existence, over 60 years of existence. It was something they could finally refer to as, you know, a, a binding principle, a binding law that um, a compendium of all the agreements, of all the punches and waiters agreements as, a, as an organization. So, um, yeah, so this, this the, the write-up you're seeing now was drawn from actually the Commonwealth Charter. The document you are seeing there, it was actually drawn from within it, okay? From, so as gotten from the Commonwealth website, 
It says that the chapter is a document of the values and aspirations which unite the Commonwealth, that he expresses the commitment of member states to development of free and democratic societies and the promotion of peace and, uh, and, and prosperity to improve the lives of all people of the Commonwealth. It might be too tiny for you to read. Well, basically, the Commonwealth acknowledged the role of civil society in supporting the goals and values of the organization, right? And if, if, you, if you were to flip through, it began by saying, we, the peoples of the Commonwealth, blah, 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 we recognize that an era of changing, you know, we, of changing uh, economic circumstances, uncertainty, new trade and economic patterns, you know, it just went down to continue to, um, to recognize, to recall, to affirm, you know, to really outline the things that they believed in as guiding principles of the organization. So that is it. So for our fourth topic, we'll be looking at some of the role of this commonwealth in contemporary society. You might be wondering, so what does commonwealth even do? So some of the things they do is they engage in decolonization, democratic promotion, economic development, and things like that. So let's begin here discovering it a little bit. <laughs> okay. So the first thing we'll look at is decolonization. And you, if, you, if you recall, uh, while we're discussing our first topic on the history and the evolution of the Commonwealth, we saw that once upon a time, a British Empire decolonized to become the Commonwealth, to become a Commonwealth of which it is today. So one of the key things, one of the core things that it does is decolonization. So it helps to, to fight for the political independence for Namibia. They also helped to bring Zimbabwe to majority rule in 1980. Yes. It was also involved in difficult political transformations in East Africa, Kenya, and transformation. Most especially, it helped to dismantle apartheid in South Africa. You know, in fact, that was one of these greatest feats. When recall last semester when we dealt on South Africa, the Commonwealth also helped. You know, to to fight apartheid in in South Africa. How? Well, it condemned increased international campaigns. You know, it, it really helped publicize the things that were happening in, in South Africa. You know, so um, while so while the ANC was dealing with the blacks in South Africa, they were able to popularize these things. They sensitized the world. They released a lot of um, secret materials. They published it all over the world. Released it in TVs and newspapers. You know, so the world. You know, a lot of human rights group got involved. A lot of people were sensitized. A lot of people were horrified about at, at what was at what was happening in South Africa at the time. Even though South Africa was a member nation. And eventually in nineteen in nineteen um, eventually in South Africa was eventually expelled from the Commonwealth at the time, following what they did in nineteen seventy one, the Sharpsville massacre. So one of issued the Lusaka declarations in nineteen seventy one, which allowed at large racial inequalities and they even sent a Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group, Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group to South Africa in 1987. And all those things helped one way or the other. It played roles to the eventual release of Nelson Mandela, please ask of, not if, of Nelson Mandela from prison in 1990. Okay. Right. So another thing that's, another thing that's, uh, the, the, Commonwealth engaging is democratic promotion. Democratic promotion. So they believed in promoting democracy all over the world. You know, through his many declarations, through his many agreements, you know. Even in 1995, the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group was formed to deal with serious and persistent violation of principles of democracy. Especially um, uh, what was also happening in South Africa. It also inspired the formation of this group. Also, an, an association, association also exists, and their core aim is to foster understanding and cooperation amongst parliament and amongst various nations, and to promote the study of institution of parliament to understand how different governments function, you know, so that they can help to keep advancing democracies in various nations of the world. And again, the Commonwealth has also affected global democratic practices through committed commitment to gender issues, human rights, monitoring of elections and all that. And all that. Another role of the Commonwealth is in economic development. So the Commonwealth has something called the Commonwealth Fund for Technical Cooperation. And this this fund 
technically he accepts he assists in economic development of less development member nations so it could help to raise funds for less developed member countries i told you that some of the reasons why these nations actually joined the commonwealth but for for one economic reason or the other and access to this fund is one of those steps one of those things that different member nations especially less developed ones would actually benefit the the commonwealth also helped to provide skills and technical expertise in various areas to member nations such as irrigation accountancy nutrition debt management and whatnot Nigeria especially has, has even benefited certain things from the Commonwealth of Nations. For instance, the organization has helped her to source markets for its group of products, uh, uh, products, especially oil. And this has also helped to foster economic relations, better economic relations between Nigeria and other advanced nations. Okay? Another thing is that it also facilitates aid programs, aid as foreign aid programs from developed members to less development so to less developed member countries and he also supports south south cooperation and rejects imf general stringent conditionalities on less developed countries now this is a big one so they have done one or two things in this area another thing the commonwealth helps to fight against is corruption and uh, it has set up something, a group called the Commonwealth Expert Group on Good Governance and Elimination of Corruption in Economic Management. So these are some of those things that um, occupies the time of the Commonwealth Secretary General and his entire team in London when the Chogum is not on. Okay, So they manage groups like this. They make sure they have teams, they have staff working in various uh, committees and various groups like this to make sure that there are various uh, values and principles and aims such as fighting corruptions and nations of the world are tackled to the best of their uh, to their ability and finally in in their course of uh, tackling corruption they have also tried to examine corruption issues country by country you know they are taxed as the commonwealth expert group they are taxed to ask questions on how certain wealth was acquired by certain individual, you know, and thereafter deliver judgment on true cause of wealth, whether legitimate or illegitimate. So that is some of the th things they do in terms of tackling corruptions amongst the member nations of the world. Another thing, another role of the Commonwealth in contemporary society is through the offer of scholarship to students through the uh, uh, offer of scholarship to students okay so from different member nations to study in universities of other commonwealth countries also they have something called the commonwealth foundation which was set up to develop and promote professional students uh, professional students among member nations they also support educational activities they award fellowships they award scholarships so fellowships to Commonwealth professionals, you know, for study visits and exchange. This one has to do with, you know, professionals. Study visits and exchange. This is a big one. So people have actually benefited from this for, since it was set up. They've also facilitated the association of Commonwealth univer universities, you know, with about 275 member institutions in 28 countries. So via this exchange, via this medium, the various progressive schemes around education are, protect, are promoted. There is movement of academic and administrative staff. There's scholarships, there's fellowships, there's distance learning, education projects, and all that amongst members. Uh, provides you know, an interactive arena whereas member nations could actually sit down and discuss one thing or the other. So it provides a forum for people of different races to interact and relate. Right? It also... This is arena in keeping with international relation theories it reduces conflicts and it promotes cooperation amongst nations. Now, other links at non-governmental levels wherein this interactive arena also helps member nations includes Commonwealth Lawyers Association, yes, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, Association of Commonwealth Universities, Commonwealth Games, Commonwealth Association on Women, Commonwealth Association on Children's Rights, Human Rights, and whatnot. There are many different arms 
of the commonwealth which we have not even examined in this course because there's just so many of them but keep in mind that they exist and they function last we'll be looking at is special privileges the commonwealth provides special privileges for for member nations right so commonwealth member countries enjoy certain privileges amongst themselves that are not according to aliens so according to aliens here refers to people who are not member nations so if you're not a member nation you might not enjoy this for example in united kingdom the right to vote is given to all commonwealth citizens resident in that country so if you live in the uk and you have your permanent residence you could actually vote and be voted for during elections so when you hear when they say all oh, these Nigerians are being voted for, Nigerians who are now members, who are members of parliament, they call them MPs in the UK. It is under the unique umbrella which the Commonwealth Forum provides. It is the special privileges which these nations provide that enable Nigerians, many Nigerians that we know today are, 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 are now in many elected positions in the United Kingdom to choose forums like this that made it possible rather like this that make it possible yes it is also replicated this this uh, this uh, special privilege is also reciprocated in other commonwealth countries right whereas people can be elected and appointed to national uh, legislatures of countries where they are not citizens of right all that uh, other privileges which are enjoyed by member countries include immigration programs such as working holiday visas and all that right okay and finally we'll just we'll mention that the commonwealth also helps in the formation of international organization community of portuguese speaking countries finally we've gotten to our last topic i hope you've been following am i going too fast i don't know so i'm trying so just tell me what you think and We'll do better as time goes on but the last thing we'd like to mention the last thing we'll be discussing here is some of the challenges of the commonwealth noble aims but again they also have imperfections and they face you know many criticisms the first criticism is that the british the commonwealth is still heavily associated with british imperialism Obviously, because one, many of their nations, many, uh, many of member nations, except two, as it now, were all formerly colonized by Britain. So it is heavily associated with British imperialism. It's almost as if um, it is seen, in fact, it's seen as an instrument of neocolonialism in the hands of Britain to retain her ex-colonies as two Gs. It is nothing less, for some even harshly criticize say it is nothing less than a British Imperial Federal Federation in the contemporary world, and it helps Britain to maintain her influence over her ex colonies. Do you agree? Do you think so? Do you agree with this assertion? Okay, so the second thing we'll look at criticism that criticism here is that the name of the organization is not in tandem with the domestic realities of its member states. So the name literally says the commonwealth. And there is nothing to suggest that the common that the wealth is common, whether financially, materially, development wise, you know, especially when African members are compared with Western member countries. So what is the magic happening in Western nations or the development nations that has just refused to happen? in less developed nations in africa and such so these are very deep issues that have many different facets and arguments to it but the fact remains that 50 out of 54 member states 50 out of 54 member states belong to the poorer states of the world why is so few so rich so few still controlling or still dominating over so many uh, nations right what wealth does Nigeria bringing it closer home? What hell does what wealth does Nigeria even have with Britain? I mean, a commonwealth would entail existence of similarities of purposes and methods for its attainment, which is not so. Instead, British interests in Nigeria remains for its own benefits to the detriment of Nigeria till today. So that is a big challenge. Okay. 
So number three challenge is that despite the noble aims of the commonwealth in bridging the gap between the rich and poor, the disparity is still so great, you know. So that even though they have made several declarations, even as far back as 1971, they have made uh, so many declarations concerning disparity between the, the, the rich and the poor, saying that they will not tolerate it. Yet these noble intentions is yet to manifest. The British, as a colon, colonial Poland, as a as a as a colonial uh, plunderer of the wealth of Africa during colonial years and afterwards, they should help to play prominent roles in facilitating her development. Yet, prevalent environmental damages, such as the role of shell in Ogoniland, is still perpetuated by Britain in Nigeria. You know, and yet they say the wealth is common. Yet, the gap between the rich and the poor is so much. These are all challenges. The four, challenges, the four challenge here we're looking at is that it appears that the Commonwealth has no power to compel its members, you know, to comply with its decision and implement its solution. So these guys meet every two years and they do a lot of talking and a lot of declarations. And at the end of the day, some member nation... So member countries just do whatever they want. They flagrantly, they openly dis disobey and violate the principles of the Commonwealth. And what happens? Aside from uh, uh, um, a suspension or certain economic sanctions, some that are not even well implemented, these things keep going on. So if the Commonwealth claims that it's not a toothless bull bulldog, it should be able to do better, right? It should be able to do better. Now, still looking at the criticisms and challenges of the Commonwealth, another thing that happens here is that, you know, the Queen of England has remained the perpetual head and symbol of the organization. Why? Is her head bigger than everybody's head? Why could she not know? Of late, people have, member countries have started to clamor and said, you know, we also have other queens, you know, I can be the Queen of Nigeria, you know. And, you know, they're saying, why is the queen, why has she remained the head? Why is she almost taking a perpetual position of, you know, of the symbol of the organization? If this wealth is truly common, if it's this true democracy, then she should be able to make way for somebody else from another country to be also be a head and the symbol of the commonwealth. To not spoil anything now, would it? But somehow, Britain has continued to, Britain and her queen has continued to op occupy this position since the British Empire days up until now, and yet we claim that the wealth is common. This is a, this is a challenge, okay? This is a challenge. Another key challenge here is something we call the crisis of legitimacy. Crisis of legitimacy. So the Commonwealth claims to be a legitimate organization. It claims to have noble organizations, you know, but certain things keep going wrong. For instance, Britain, during, you know, during the apartheid years of Britain, and you know the commonwealth sat down together and said you know what we're going to put economic sanctions on south africa no member country should trade with south africa nobody you know they put economic sanctions and said no more trade in arms no more trade in anything warfare no more economic trade with them so that you know they can really stop the so force them to soft pedal on appetite but britain the britain will continue to relate to south africa after she was banned, after that was banned due to appetite in, from the Commonwealth, after she was banned from being a member of the Commonwealth by Britain, and Britain is the head of, you know, their queen is the head, right? So they should know better. So, but they continued to relate with South Africa after her ban due to uh, uh, appetite and flouting the rules of the organization. So to the shock and disappointment of especially African nations who looked up to Britain, you know, yet the Britain didn't care. She only focused on her own foreign policies and continued to trade with, uh, with South Africa. Even in the height of it, in fact, half of it, they came up with, and uh, Britain came up with, came up with uh, a talk that the only reason he was still, she was still relating with South Africa at the time was because she was being a nation. She was trying to honor an agreement they had earlier signed called the Simstein Town Agreement. You know, so when the organization was saying stop, when everybody was saying stop, Britain found the reason to, 
to keep doing whatever she wanted for her own benefit with South Africa. She still sold helicopters, six helicopters, to South Africa during this time. Right? Yet, contrary to the threat, so this angered many nations of, many member nations, you know, there was a lot of uproar in the Commonwealth at the time. Many nations threatened to quit, including uh, the Nigerian uh, head of government that was a member, he threatened to quit the Commonwealth and all that. But despite all the threats to punish Britain, you know, because he's the bigger dog, no, no, nobody could really compel them to do anything, you know. All the nations that threatened against Britain, they still didn't leave the Commonwealth, they didn't do anything at the end of the day. All these things reflect on the legitimacy of the Commonwealth as an organization. If it was legitimate, if it could really do anything, would it continue to allow somebody that supposedly should know best to continue to flout his own, you know, uh, violate his own principles, okay? Another thing was, another challenge of the Commonwealth was the challenge of credibility. Challenge of credibility. So, again, um, we, we're going to be using the Ian Smith Unilateral Declaration of the Independence of Southern Rhodesia as an example. Right? So, this guy, one man, single-handedly declared independence of Southern Rhodesia at the time. And while the declaration was roundly condemned in Africa and elsewhere, while other members of the Commonwealth Nations Consultative Forum, which was held in Lagos, Nigeria in 1960s at the time, agreed on sanction against Smith's government. Britain, again, refused to commit fully to the oil sanctions which all these nations had agreed on against uh, Rhodesia. He refused to commit fully to oil sanctions which Rhodesia would have felt more. Instead, you know, because of her interest in oil with Rhodesia, they deliberately encouraged leakages through the activities of our company in South Africa, which continued to counter the effects of the economic sanctions against South Rhodesia for the interest of British. If the nation, so if Commonwealth was credible, if the association was as credible as it claims in its many noble declarations, would it allow Britain to continue to flout and violate its principles like that? So issues like this and many more are things that threaten or challenge the noble aims of the Commonwealth till today. That's all, folks. That's all. Thank, Thank you for listening and God bless you. Have a nice day. Bye.